State House Studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capitol Journal. It has been quite a week in the Alabama legislature. The House and Senate met for the 10th, 11th, and 12th legislative days. That leaves 18 possible meeting days left in the session, with two spring break weeks planned for March. Lawmakers spent much of the week dealing with an issue they never expected to crop up going into this year's session, in vitro fertilization and attempting to offer IVF clinics and patients liability protections in the wake of the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling that frozen embryos are to be considered children under Alabama law. That ruling led IVF clinics across the state to pause their services, leaving prospective patients in limbo. This week, hundreds of IVF advocates descended on the State House to urge lawmakers to take action. Capitol Journal's Randy Scott has the story. It's full speed ahead for the regular session when lawmakers get new proposals due to a decision from the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling on IVF treatments. The result is hundreds of citizens coming to the State House to let their voices be heard. Our motto is advanced fertility care close to home. The Supreme Court ruling threatens the existence of our practice as well as the availability of advanced fertility treatments to the women and families of Alabama. We believe that any solution must provide protection for patients and clinics. The Alabama House Democratic Caucus discusses a proposal they're standing behind. House Bill 225 would codify into law a fundamental fact that a fertilized embryo outside of a human uterus is certainly not any form of person under law. Representative Terry Collins introduces House Bill 237 to also address this topic. This proposal was approved and appears on the House floor for debate on Thursday. This bill would provide civil and criminal immunity or death or de criminal immunity or death or damage to an embryo to any individual or entity when providing or receiving goods or services related to in vitro fertilization. You know, a lot of us came to the microphone to talk and say, let's look at this bill before we pass it so that we won't have any misinterpretation of its intent. The ruling by Supreme Court Justice Parker is a misinterpretation of what the intent was of the Alabama abortion bill. House Bill 237 is approved. At the State House, Randy Scott, Capitol Journal. The Senate unanimously approved a similar bill on Thursday as well. So, where are we in this process? It takes five legislative days for a bill to become a law. Thursday was, the, was day three of that process. The bills will go to the other chambers for committee consideration likely on Tuesday, with the earliest possible final passage on Wednesday. And because what the House and Senate passed were slightly different, a conference committee to iron out the differences could be needed. Another important thing to note, these bills are meant specifically to address the IVF liability issue in order to get clinics operational again. Many on both sides acknowledge that additional legislation addressing the more long-term fallout from the ruling might be necessary. We will continue to keep you updated with the latest here on Capitol Journal. Another big issue this week was gambling, not because any votes were taken, but because of a confusing committee meeting that left lawmakers and advocates wondering what the future is on this issue. The Senate Tourism and Economic Development Committee met Wednesday for its regular meeting. There were no bills posted on the agenda, but a public hearing was eventually called to allow advocates to have their say all while there was alternative legislation being drafted behind the scenes. This led to some confusion and irritation among committee members who said they were unaware the legislation was before them or what was in the potential substitute. Jeff Sanders has more on what happened and what might happen next with the gambling package. A chaotic committee hearing this week on proposed gambling legislation. Uh, everything that I saw on this meeting was to be announced. 
didn't know what bill was going to be here, didn't know it was going to be a public hearing. About six or seven on the, the list to speak. If it'd be acceptable with you all, I would ask the chairman if we give them each a minute to speak, and then I'm going to move to adjourn. Democratic and Republican members of the Senate Tourism and Economic this Development Committee upset over why they were not told gambling and a public hearing would be on the agenda. Just almost like a little baby sham. You know, they, they just up there talking and expressing themselves, but they back there putting it together on whatever, they, whatever they're using to do it. Democratic Senator Roger Smitherman referring to a pair of substitute bills being written to replace gambling legislation already passed in the House. Republican Senator Greg Albritton is carrying those bills in the Senate. This is what you see in the sausage making. Uh, you try to put something together, and, and I'll admit, I was the cause of today's meeting, meaning I, I wanted to have my bill on the, on, in the committee. I was accommodated that, but when you have two other uh, subs that's interfering, and then you have others that are doing this and different vote counts and such, it throws a monkey wrench into that sausage. All Britain tabled his bills for now and says he's hopeful to put together legislation that can gain broad support. Minority leader Bobby Singleton says he's met with Republicans drafting substitute gambling bills. Over the weekend that we can come back with a draft, put it on in committee by Tuesday and be something that we can vote on. What we need to do is just to come up with something where everybody's included. And whatever legislation potentially comes out of committee next week will then head here to the Senate floor for what could be a very contentious debate. Reporting for Capital Journal, I'm Jeff Sanders. You've heard us report that school choice is among the top priorities for Republican leaders and Governor Kay Ivey. This week, the House passed House Bill 129 from State Representative Danny Garrett, dubbed the Choose Act. It would allow parents up to $7,000 a year in tax credits to fund their child's tuition at a private school or other choice option. It would also allow homeschool parents up to $2,000 to cover those expenses. There were some changes made to the bill, including putting financial guardrails on the tax credits and requiring any private schools participating to share testing data with parents and the state. That made the bill more palatable to education groups, but House Democrats remain opposed and argued on the floor that school choice ultimately undermines public schools. Garrett said some of that opposition might come around when their fears aren't realized. Alabama already has a number of school choice options, but this was um, education savings account was one option we didn't offer, and that seems to be what most states are looking at now who go down that road. So the discussion began several years ago, and um, I think as you, as, as, as not a normal with uh, uh, legislation, things evolve over time. People became more educated, more comfortable with, this, with, the, with the discussion, what it was, what it wasn't. And um, the governor, of course, made it her number one priority this year. The lieutenant governor had been, has been talking about it for a couple of years. So it was a, to the point that I think we, we were ready to, to make a move. And so to, to bring a bill about, we, we worked with the governor. Senator Chairman Orr and I worked together with, with, um, with the governor's staff. We also had uh, involvement from the education communities. We've talked to people who were pro-school choice, those who were not pro-school choice. And it winded up with a bill that I think um, I said uh, early on that if you were against school choice, you should like this bill. If you're for school choice, you should like this bill because I think we hit the sweet spot that gave comfort to those who were concerned about the education budget being gutted. My full interview with Chairman Garrett later in the show. Another controversial issue was debated this week, absentee voting and what Republicans characterize as ballot harvesting. Senate Bill 1, from Senator Garland Gudger was in the House Campaigns, Elections, and Campaign Finance Committee on Wednesday. The bill would make it a crime to handle a non-family member's ballot application. Democrats fiercely opposed the measure, arguing it would make it more difficult for elderly and disabled voters to cast ballots. Gudger said there's a lot of misinformation being spread about what the bill actually does. I've been all over the state in the last nine months listening to people that opposed the bill and people that were for the bill. Uh, this substitute that's being presented today is the best to my ability to make changes to produce a bill that is for all the people of Alabama. So voting is secure, honest, and it knocks down what I call the last leg 
I'm a way that the bad actors out there are trying to steal our elections on the local, state, federal elections. This bill should not be read as a Republican bill. This bill should not be read as a Democrat bill. This bill should not be read as an independent bill. This should be a bill for every Alabamian to have fair and honest elections. That bill was approved by the committee and is now in position for consideration by the full House. Secretary of State Wes Allen will join me later in the show for a fuller explanation of the bill. A major development this week from Governor Kay Ivey and leaders involved with broadband internet efforts. Ivey announced an investment of nearly $150 million to bring high-speed internet to areas in Alabama that need it most. The plan includes giving out 66 grants to 16 internet companies who will extend high-speed fiber lines in 48 counties. We've heard a lot about the middle mile projects that serve as kind of connectors off the main internet thoroughfares. These funds would go toward the last mile with more than 5,000 miles of internet cables connecting almost 54,000 places like homes, businesses, hospitals, schools, and libraries. We have received national recognition for this innovative approach. In 2021, Alabama ranked near the bottom nationally in broadband connectivity at number 47. By last year, we had risen 23 steps to be among the top 24 states in broadband readiness. When we talk about our state, the best place to work, raise a family, and how we do that is projects that help people and helps our state succeed. This is the new Alabama and I am certainly proud to be a part of it. It's a great example of Alabama collaborating and working together. You've got the private sector, you've got government, uh, you've got different industries, you've got people in the north, the south, everybody collaborating on what's going to be great for Alabama's future. And we all know how important the internet is and how important that coverage is going to be across our state. I've said before, Alabama cannot be all that we want her to be if she's only growing along the interstate. She must be growing in rural Alabamas with opportunities there, just as is the case in our most successful urban areas. Some big news this week for U.S. Senator Katie Britt. The first term senator has been tapped to deliver the Republican response to President Joe Biden's State of the Union address. That's scheduled for Thursday, March 7th. This is a big deal. It puts Senator Britt in the national spotlight as most news outlets will air the response directly after the president's speech. House Speaker Mike Johnson and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said they jointly decided that Britt was the right choice to contrast with Biden. They cited her story as the youngest Republican woman elected to the Senate and the only Republican mother of school-aged children. It's a uniquely effective narrative to connect with everyday Americans, they said. We will certainly be watching and look forward to having Senator Britt back on the show here in the coming weeks. Tuesday is Election Day. There are Republican and Democratic primaries for President, Congress, Supreme Court Chief Justice, and other races. Also on the ballot is a constitutional amendment that would slightly alter the process used in the legislature to pass bills. Amendment 1 would remove a special legislative hurdle called the Budget Isolation Resolution from local, non-controversial bills. I sat down with State Senator Clyde Chamlis this week for a thorough explanation of this amendment to help voters understand just what's on the ballot. Here's part of that conversation. So there's a couple things that maybe you need to have an understanding of before you understand the question. The first one is the Budget Isolation Resolution, BIR is what we call it. That is a constitutional amendment that says we are to deal with the budgets before we deal with legislation, mm -hmm. any legislation. So the Constitution also provides a, uh, an exception, a workaround, if you will. If you have three-fifths of those voting, uh, you can set aside the, the budgets and do whatever legislation that you want. Mm -hmm. We do that routinely all the time. Because it's typically late in the session when the budgets are ready. And there's a good reason for that. Early in the session versus late in the session, 
we have three more months of data to do our projections. So the later in the session you do your budget projections, the more accurate they're gonna be. So there's a, there's a good reason to do that. So the second thing that you have to understand is local leg legislation and how that works. Local legislation is legislation that applies to a specific county or a specific city. The delegation that represents any part of that county or city has a say in that legislation. If any one of those legislators, House or Senate, objects to that legislation, it's dead. You have to have 100% unanimous support among the local delegation. So these are non-controversial things? Non-controversial issues. If they're controversial, you'll have a split and it will never get this far. Mm -hmm. So putting all of that together, what happens with local legislation is just a formality. Um, the, the third thing that I wanted to mention that you have to understand is that I, as a legislator in central Alabama, I'm not really worried about, nor am I going to take the time to read, study, and research local legislation from, say, the Northeast or, or any other part of the county, uh, mm -hmm. state. So I really don't want to vote on that because I don't know what it is. I don't really need to know what it is. So then you get into this question of, three-fifths of what? Three-fifths of the body, three-fifths of the quorum, three-fifths of those voting, and it's been interpreted different ways by a lot of smart people over the years. This amendment would just clear all of that out. You have 100% agreement by your local delegation. It doesn't have to go through the BIR, and it, it goes through the legislative process mm -hmm. like any other bill. Now, I wouldn't want to eliminate this on all legislation because that's different. You don't have local courtesy, you don't have that, diff it applies to the whole state. So that is a totally different issue than local legislation. As always, you can find out more information about the election at the Secretary of State's website, alabamavotes.gov. When we come back, we'll go deeper on the IVF issue with Representative Terry Collins, who is sponsoring one of the bills aimed at fixing the problem, as well as Representative Peblin Warren for the Democrats' perspective. House Education Budget Committee Chairman Danny Garrett joins me to discuss his school choice bill and where we are in the budget process. And Alabama Secretary of State Wes Allen is in studio to talk about what you need to know before you go to the polls on Tuesday, plus more about that absentee voting bill. Stay with us. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is State Representative Terry Collins of Decatur. Representative, thanks for coming on the show. Glad to be with you, Todd. It's been quite a week uh, yes. in committee, on the floor, um, and specifically on the issue of in vitro fertilization. Yes. Uh, you have a bill uh, passed the House this week trying to address this issue, trying to make yes. sure that clinics can operate without fear of being sued. So walk me through what your bill does and how it uh, addresses the problem. Well, right now, several of our clinics have closed and some of the others have threatened because they feel like the, um, there's a bigger liability now than they had felt before the Supreme Court ruling last week. Mm -hmm. And so this bill offers an immunity for that, for the um, embryo, and for them as the provider and for the receivers, so for the patients, which yesterday we realized that we had not covered them with some immunity, mm -hmm. and so this did both. Um, it's moved very quickly last week and this week. We discussed it every day last week. We had a different bill almost every day last week. Changed over the weekend, it changed up until today. It has stayed the same, although I think I might have heard the Senate took an amendment. So. Um, yep. We are moving fast, but we're moving fast for the same reason that we saw so many advocates here yesterday um, at the State House 
many of who were literally in the middle of a process mm -hmm. and when their clinics paused, it paused their process and they're going through um, pretty extreme processes and, and even painful sometimes and to stop that in the middle, that's been our biggest goal mm -hmm. is to keep, to get these clinics to open back up as we work through what I'll call the deeper issues of the ruling that the Supreme Court had. Yeah, because timing is so critical in, in that process. We have um, five days to pass legislation um, because you get three readings in each house, and I know you know this, but I'm sure everybody else doesn't understand it. So we filed a bill Tuesday, so it got a first reading. It went through committee on Wednesday, so it got a second reading, and then was on the floor today where it got a third reading in the House, but we submitted it already, transmitted it to the Senate. So it's gotten its first reading in the Senate today, on Thursday. So next Tuesday, it could be in committee in the Senate, and then by Wednesday, it could pass, be signed by the governor, and then the clinics that we've spoken with feel comfortable to open. Okay, that's important. So ne next Wednesday is, is the soonest possible. It is the soonest possible, but it is, I think, possible that that's how it could work out. Yeah. I remember talking to you when the ruling, uh, or the effects of the ruling were st first starting to uh, come, and you were, you were considering legislation, and you said, you know, yeah, we need to act quickly, but we need to get it right. Right. Um, which is... I think we uh, said that last Thursday. Yeah, I and think, here we are this Thursday. Well, yeah. That, so, that, are you confident that what we're what you're doing is going to get it right? I mean, you mentioned you may have to revisit this because um, this is a, a bigger issue than just the clinics. It truly is a bigger issue than just the clinics, and I think it's some very hard conversations. I think it's um, conversations on both sides of the aisle and within the the very super majority Republican caucus. Mm -hmm. I don't know where we're going to go. I'm not going to guesstimate on that. But I know we've got to have some discussions about what we want to do. We have a constitutional amendment that says we're a pro-life state. We have um, Human Life Protection Act passed in 19 that um, talks about not being able to have an abortion. There are some exceptions for the life of the mother and all. but. Um, we have strong pro-life. We feel like we're a strong pro-life state, and I'm proud to be a part of that. But I also believe that through in vitro fertilization and through these methods, these women and families are building their family. And I think that's, we want to be a pro-family state Trying to as have well. Babies. That's right. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of gets to my next question because um, it seems like that amendment and the 19 bill, your bill, um, when they were passed, it was almost theoretical, you know, because Roe was still right. in place. Right. Nobody knew Dobbs was coming yet. Um, and so it was almost kind of easier to pass those laws and, and vote for those things without, like, the real-world consequences and, and what actually happens. Now we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. And so do you think it's going to be – because, it, look, it's going to be politically tough to open any can of worms dealing with abortion or when life begins and all that for Republicans. But do you think this issue and how it's just blown up um, nationwide even, does that, do you think that would encourage Republicans, your caucus, the Senate, to be able to revisit these issues without the political risk that it might have been before? I would say there were times this week as we've moved quickly, but trying to get right words that while they provide some immunity, they we are making sure the clinics are willing to open. Um, I had hopes that we might be closer than we thought. I'll say that yesterday, I thought that. Today, after being on the House floor, I'm not sure I have those same hopes. It's just such a hard issue. And people have um, such strong feelings about it as an issue of faith and, and of life and of all these different things. And after standing for several hours on the floor, um, listening to people chat with me about this, um, we're not near each other on lots of these issues, so it is going to be a hard lift, but that doesn't mean it's not a lift that we end up having to make because we can't stay in just limbo about it. We may have to come up with some decisions, and 
We've got groups that are already looking into um, how other states are dealing with this, what's happening. You know, a lot of the in vitro fertilization is new in concept and growing. It's a very ever changing um, science and we want to be cutting edge, but we also want to make sure we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are other issues that we have to discuss and look at. And all I can say is that's what we're doing right now. I've got a meeting to do that next week. We're going to start these conversations and um, we're truly not trying to kick it down the road. We're trying to open the clinics this week and then we'll try to deal with the issue at heart. An issue we're going to be following very closely into next week. Thank you so much for your time. I want to have you back to talk about education. You're the House <laughs> Education <laughs> Policy Chairman, and there's lots of issues. So please come back, and we'll yeah. talk uh, about a, I'll look know, to. A, a better topic. I'll be glad to. Thanks again. Thanks. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is State Representative Peblin Warren of Tuskegee. Representative, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for the invitation as always. Well, we're talking about IVF, in yes. vitro fertilization. It's been the, the topic really of the last two weeks, but legislation was moving this week. Y'all spent a lot of time talking about it in the House. I know you were part of the press conference yes. early in the week to just really get out the word about what House Democrats think needs to be done. It wasn't your bill, it was Representative Collins' bill, but, but what is your perspective on that? It passed, but are you of the mind that it needs to change before it becomes law? Yeah, I think to be honest with you, none of us saw this coming. This is something that just hit us so hard and you had so many of our constituents calling. You know, they've, been, they've been here day to day trying to tell us what, you know, what, what the situation really is because not knowing, we had no idea what was going on. And I think as a quick remedy, um, um, Representative um, Anthony Daniels submitted House Bill 225, that was the bill that we met on. And at the same time, on the other side, the Republicans between the House and the Senate was trying to work on a bill. So what they decided to do was to take the, um, the Republicans' bill and just give a, 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 a quick remedy because that's all it is. Basically, when you're seeing that people have embryos um, at, at different facilities, they wanted to continue the process, they were even uh, prohibited from getting the embryos. Once everything just shut down, it was just, it was chaos. Because all the liability. Yeah, every, everything was there and you start thinking and talking about this and talking about that. So all this bill does, and, and it's, it's kind of scary because it basically validates what's there now, but making it retroactive and only doing it for this sector. Okay, now that, that's, that's a lot because, you know, you got all other kind of doctors out there doing all kinds of things, but this is just only to uh, deal with this situation today. And I think that we're going to have to go back. We're going to have to look at the constitutional amendment as to what is a human being actually. As you know, uh, the Supreme Court says that that embryo is a human being, a living human being. And it's, it's, uh, and they're basing it on the constitutional amendment that's out there about life and, and, and what's... Uh, personhood. Personhood and, yeah. and all the other stuff. But you know and I know that there's no way that a human being could come into existence, be frozen, thawed out, and is a human being. That's, 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 that's where the technical parts come in. And as a matter of fact, when my comments today that I made, 
I told them, you know, so often we sit and we do bills and we come up with situations with limited knowledge. We don't know. You know, we're not experts in all these fields. And at some of these fields, we're really out of our place and trying to decide. And I told them we need to go to our medical colleges, uh, South Alabama, UAB, and get with the physicians, get the right language, get, get what's actually happening in the situation and not sit up and make it a partisan issue and come up with a bill that's going to write it. I promise you, if we had to write a bill ourselves, there are going to be flaws in it because we don't know, you know, what's right and what's wrong because we all want to see any person who wants to have a family should have an opportunity to do it, you know, and I think that everything has been done, you know, by the book so far the only thing that's really really scary and i gave him an example today of a friend of mine who had some embryos that were frozen and i think she ended up having three placed in her uh two of the babies died one was born with a severe physical mental condition and she was told that if she used the other uh, embryos it would basically be the same thing so I mean why would you save embryos that you know are not going to be healthy bodies but at the same time what we're looking at now they can be charged with murder yeah and getting to your point about the constitutional amendment because that's come up a lot and I've, I've heard from legal experts that yes this short-term fix this immediate statutory fix will enable the clinics to operate. So that's kind of issue number one. But the constitutional amendment could be an issue. But it's also a very political one because going back to why it was passed in the first place. This yes. is a pro-life you know, measure. Yes. It's a pro-life movement. And so I could, I could see some hesitancy on the Republican side of doing anything to change that because, you know, it, it was put in place for that reason, to appeal to the conservative pro-life folks. So what are the conversations like there? I mean, that seems like a, a big well, hurdle. Well, it, it, it's, it's going to be a hurdle, but I, I'm, I'm going to remain uh, optimistic that it's a situation where we are going to have to come together. We're going to have to get something that's going to be acceptable by all of us because you, you're going to have those splits over there. You, I, I doubt if you got too many splits on our side, but you're going to have a splits on the other side. So again, the whole point with them in this issue, like many other issues, let's come together. Don't sit out here in this group and decide what it's going to be and bring it over here to this group with us and tell us this is what it is. Let's sit down together, start together, and, and again, with the proper advising from the medical profession, work all those situations out because we got to define what life is. Yeah, so going back to 2018 when that amendment passed, 2019 when the abortion ban mm -hmm. passed, you know, those things, while they were debated a lot, um, they were almost enacted in a theoretical sense because yes. Roe was still in place and there we had no idea that Dobbs was coming. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, I think many voters out there probably weren't even paying attention because they didn't have like real world right, right. Impl implications. Right. Now it does. It does. And so do you think that changes the debate at all in terms of wow, okay, we've heard from folks that, that, that this is affected. We may not have meant for all this to affect it in that way. Do you think that makes it more likely that Republicans would be willing to revisit it? I think that they realize that they're going to have to revisit it because nobody saw this coming. You know, we just, everything was going along smoothly. Everybody was doing what they were doing. But after this ruling from the Supreme Court, it, that, that put a whole new light on what we had in place. And I, 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 I know they're going to have to make some changes now. How? Because, you know, we got that strong, strong pro-life group out there. and I, that. But again, just be common sense will tell you that if you have an embryo over here that's not a healthy embryo, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with it? I mean, you, you can put it in the mother, let her have the baby, the baby's born dead. I mean, who wants to do that? I think that there's going to have to be easier ways that we can get this thing resolved without looking at, at it as some criminal act or really, in the minds of some folks, a sinful act. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's where the you know rhetoric meets reality and, and all that, and that's why we're talking about it. And an issue that nobody expected 
the legislature to be dealing with is now kind of the biggest story it's, it's, in the country. It's, it's, it's the biggest story in the country. And, you know, we had all this week we've had all the national stations, CNN, the Foxes, everybody's mm -hmm. been here. <laughs> they said, well, we probably look up and see MSNBC. We know we don't know who's here. But it's, it's, it's a situation because it sends the wrong message to other states. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, we are going to be following this legislation through the, through the House, Senate, maybe a conference committee. We'll, we'll be following it. But I really appreciate your perspective on this, and I hope you'll come back on. Okay, well, thank you so much, and we look forward to coming up with a reasonable solution that everybody can live with. Because, you know, again, we, 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 we sometimes get too much into other people's personal lives. And this is where we are now. You know, these are personal decisions that people are making about their embryos and, and, and to be dictated by um, some political sideline actions. It's just, it's not right. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks again. Okay, and thank you so much, too. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is State Representative Danny Garrett, Chairman of the House Education Budget Committee. Mr. Chairman, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it was a big week for you because you passed the the, the Choose Act. School choice has kind of been a, a big buzzword for the last couple of years, but especially this year. Uh, y'all put together legislation, passed it through the House. Well, tell me kind of where y'all came to this exact bill, because there's a lots of different kind of choice options out there. How did y'all arrive at this particular policy? Well, you know, we, we've been discussing school choice probably for the last three or four years, and uh, it's, a, it's a fairly new concept in turn. It's, it's, it's been around for a while, but it's really gained momentum in the last five or six years other, as other states have adopted school choice options. Alabama already has a number of school choice options, but this was um, education savings account was one option we didn't offer, and that seems to be what most states are looking at now who go down that road. So the discussion began several years ago, and um, I think as you as as is not unnormal with uh, ed, uh, legislation, things evolve over time. People became more educated, more comfortable with this, with the with the discussion, what it was, what it wasn't. And um, the governor, of course, made it her number one priority this year. The lieutenant governor had been, has been talking about it for a couple of years. So it was a, to the point that I think we, we were ready to, to make a move. And so to, to bring a bill about, we, so we worked with the governor. Senator Chairman Orr and I worked together with, with, um, with the governor's staff. We also had uh, involvement from the education communities. We've talked to people who were pro-school choice, those who were not pro-school choice. And it winded up with a bill that I think um, I said uh, early on that if you were against school choice, you should like this bill. If you're for school choice, you should like this bill because I think we hit the sweet spot that gave comfort to those who were concerned about the education budget being gutted, but also we gave a meaningful bill, a meaningful investment in school choice options for those who really it's an important issue. So uh, at our public hearing, we had a number of speakers. All the major education groups basically uh, were neutral, which was, um, you know, I think an accomplishment and speaks to the quality of the bill. Mm -hmm. A lot of people supporting it. Yeah, and because I, I, I noticed that, and, and like thinking about groups like Alabama Education Association, superintendents. So when they were neutral, I thought, okay, well maybe this won't get a whole lot of debate on the floor, but it did. Democrats right. were very outspoken against this bill, took up four hours of debate, which was a little surprising to me. So, I mean, there are obviously still concerns about that, about public tax dollars going to private entities and, and how that all works. What, how do you allay those concerns for uh, Democrats? Yeah, I really wish that this bill were a bipartisan bill, and I made that statement on the floor because I really do believe and know that this bill will benefit uh, children in both Democrat and Republican areas all across the state. Um, initially, for the first couple of years, um, this bill will, will be based upon, there's an income cap to even participate in the program, and then for the duration of the program, there will always be a priority given based upon income, and so some of these lower income areas of the state and that are underperforming or have other issues um, it's going to offer an opportunity for children in those, in those areas. So I think it will be um, impactful across the state. 
Um, but I also feel like that um, the, the, there's, a, there's a misunderstanding about what it is and what it isn't. And, and people believe that we were basically just providing a voucher program um, to pay for private tuition for wealthy children, and we're not. Um, this, is a, this will offer choice immediately in some areas of the state. In many areas of the state, there are, is no existing choice option, but this could be a funding vehicle to help that, um, to help create an option. So um, I think as, as we move forward, it's important that we um, um, engage people and educate people about what this is and what isn't. And also, the other point we made was that we continue to invest heavily in public education. That's a constitutional obligation we have. This year we'll have a record education budget. We'll increase it $370 million more than we had last year. Um, I think also this tees up perfectly the discussion about how we fund education. Mm -hmm. And right now we're using a funding formula, funding model that's been in existence for 30 years. We're one of six states who basically fund education based upon the number of heads you have. Not even the number of heads you currently have. It's how many heads you had 20 days after Labor Day and then it takes two years really to catch to change that. Right. Um, most states have looked at really um, how you, how, in, in areas where there are particular needs, score those needs and, and fund accordingly. So we're doing some discussions right now preliminarily about how we can do that. We're gonna to continue to invest in public education heavily and any, any study that's been done about labor participation or innovation commission or how to improve um, anything in the state, it all begins with education. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna to continue to invest in education. This is another option that will benefit children. There, there will also be children who can move from one public school to another public school. And, and, and ch children transfer or, or need different options for reasons other than just academics. Some are just in an environment that's just not conducive to them. Today's um, life that we live is all about uh, flexibility and customization and choices in everything we do. And I think education needs to evolve to that and is evolving to that. I definitely want to get into that funding model. Uh, maybe uh, we have more time because I know Tennessee made some moves on that. I think it's a in the future going to be a, a real interesting uh, concept to go about. But let's talk about the current budget year or the one that you're, you're budgeting for, I guess, the next fiscal year. Where is the Education Trust Fund? When can we expect that to really start moving? Because it starts downstairs in the House, right? Right. Yes, this year it starts in the House. The, the General Fund will begin in the Senate. Uh, typically, we like to have the budget from the lower chamber or the whichever chamber starts first <clears throat> to the next chamber you know, somewhere just past maybe the halfway point to allow, but, but uh, we're already almost to that point now because yeah. we've been doing three-day weeks and we've had um, the first week we were kind of focused on the gaming issue. So uh, right now we're a little bit behind the eight ball, but we're about to have some break times, break periods here. So I would say that, that we'll have the budget, you know, in the next uh, two or three weeks, we should have the House, should have the budget on the floor. Um, Senator Orr and I have been in discussion all along about some of the priorities. We have so much money, we had so much money last year and now that we're, we, we're kind of being strategic in how we do it and we're aligned in how we kind of need to uh, prioritize our spending. So I think that um, we have still have plenty of time, but uh, it's crunch time clearly for the budget. We're in good shape though, we're in great shape. We don't have as much money as we had last year in the supplemental. Last year we had $2.8 billion. This year we'll have about $670 million. And this is excess, excess revenue, right? Excess this, revenue. Yeah. Still have plenty of reserves. We have about $1.75 billion in the Investment Technology Fund. We'll certainly free up some of that in the budget. So we've got some decisions to nail down, but uh, we're in good financial shape. And that's really because we have, over the past several years, with all the influx of federal money and how that's in, in, increased the revenue in our state, uh, we have not spent everything we took in. And we've been very um, fiscally conservative in how we manage that, made some good investments. So um, I think we're in, in, in really good financial shape. Uh, and again, we last year passed a, a secondary cap that limits the amount the budget can grow. This year the budget can only grow 6.25%. That's $370 million for the K through 12. And the rest goes to reserve, right? Well, well, there's actually about $550 million total between higher ed and, and K-12. But yeah, that's, that's what's, uh, yeah, the remaining there's a waterfall. Some would go to budget stabilization, some goes to A&T, some goes to the new education savings account that we can access apart from proration. Um, and then others would be available for next year's supplemental. So we're, we're, we're in really good financial shape. I'm thinking back to 10 years ago when budgets weren't healthy and the reserves were get, getting completely drained. So that, this is a completely different yeah. uh, 
scenario. While I've got you, we don't have much time left, but I wanted to ask you about the Literacy Act. This is one of those really monumental um, laws that was passed, you know, back in 2019. Went through COVID, but this year will be the year that it actually the accountability provision will actually go into effect. Meaning, you know, if, if you can't read by third grade, if you're not a proficient reader, you, you possibility of getting held back. There are programs to mitigate that and try to get kids ready for the fourth grade. But are you confident uh, that the implementation of this law has been adequate and, and, and good enough to where it's going to work as intended? Well, I think that it will eventually work as intended. And the, 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 the intention is to improve reading scores and have children proficient in reading by the third grade. That's very critical. And third grade and beyond, you can't stop at third grade. You have to continue. So we're doing a lot of investment in, the, in, in, our, in our financial investments and also in our uh, resources to, that we're doing to, to that effort. But this is a critical year because uh, this is the year that we'll, the first year that we'll be able to retain students who did not meet those standards. Now there are some, if you're not retained, there's a summer time to maybe catch right. up and do some, some remediation. But if you believe the predictors, and I asked the State Department when they spoke to Dr. Mackey, when he spoke to us, to our committee, are we ready for this? Because, you know, some think between 20 and 25 percent of third grade could be retained on this standard. And what that does locally to a system would be, it would mean that you may have uh, fewer children moving to fourth grade, so maybe, maybe some shifting of resources yeah. from one to the other. But, but uh, you know, my question was, are the parents ready? Are the schools ready? Are we ready? And I think the governor made it pretty clear that I will veto anybody that wants to, any bill that comes back to try to further delay this. It's something we have to um, just eventually tackle and do. And I think we're very hopeful that maybe we do better than what the uh, predictors may indicate. But I think in the long run, it's the best thing for these children and for the state at large. Yeah, I mean, talking about socially promoting children that can't read really does them a disservice right. to send them to fourth grade if they're not prepared and, you know, kind of snowballs from there. And, and I'll say this too about school choice. You know, last year I had a, a year-round school bill which fell flat, but I think that we've had a lot, uh, that didn't really literally mean that everybody had to go school year-round, but extended the number of days that the system can operate and, and give them, gave them flexibility to perhaps have a schedule that was different than what the traditional model is. Because right now, under some of the schools that are doing this, they will have remediation periods throughout the year as opposed to waiting the summer to catch up. And so I think if we can, we're looking at that in this year's budget as well, maybe help provide for some of those options. Yesterday, City of Birmingham schools came and presented to us how their intercession program worked during COVID. Their, their reading and math scores actually improved during COVID because of these intercession programs. And that's because you don't have to wait a year to have that learning catch up. So I think that school choice options will actually, um, even within the public schools, will allow us to further address that issue and better prepare our children. Lots of issues to watch on the education front. Mr. Chairman, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, appreciate it. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page you can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Election Day is this coming Tuesday, and joining me next is Alabama's chief election official, Secretary of State Wes Allen. Mr. Secretary, thanks yes, for sir. coming on the show. Thanks, Ty. Call me Wes. <laughs> well, it is Election Day on Tuesday. It is. Big day. Uh, Y'all have been mm -hmm. preparing for this for months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do voters need to know before yeah. they go to the polls on Tuesday? Well, just know that Alabama elections are safe, secure, and transparent. And we've been working since those court-ordered maps came out last fall. Um, preparation with our probate judges, circuit clerks, sheriffs, boards of registrars. Uh, so it's been going really good. We're excited. Uh, everybody's been working extremely hard in our election staff and, of course, at the local level. Uh, if you don't have those probate judges, circuit clerks, and sheriffs and boards of registrars, you really don't have elections. I mean, they do it. You know, as a former probate judge, I can tell you a lot goes into it behind the scenes that the public never sees. And I just want to publicly thank them for the hard work they do in preparation leading up to Election Day, because it's all about preparation. And of course, can't forget the poll workers. You know, yeah. they do a, it's a long day. They get there at 6.15, 6.30, open up at 7.00 closes at 7 p.m. and then of course wrapping everything up getting everything back to the courthouse for the unofficial results you know it takes it takes a lot of time and effort and 
um, I just want to thank these guys that because they're important to yeah. the process. All got to be on the same page. No doubt. I, I, I love it because it's it's a it's a sense of duty and patriotism. It that is goes, in, goes into that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the different lines, right? These two congressional districts sure. changed quite a bit, and really, yeah. really the the fifth changed too, yeah. or, or the sixth changed yeah. too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, p people might not really know what district right. they're in. How can people, right. whether it's here in the Montgomery area, down in Mobile, how can they figure out which district they're in? So we've got a great tool on alabamavotes.gov at our website. So if they'll go there and go to the elections tab, and it's got a little tab there that you can go in and put your name in, full name, and then your birth date. And it'll pull up a little uh, map, show you your district, show you, you know, where you're supposed to go vote, who you vote, for, you know, school board district, state rep district, mm -hmm. state senate district, congressional district. So it's got all of it, all that information. It's a really neat tool. I would suggest all of our viewers here go check it out if they've got any kind of question about if their precinct has changed. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. especially when, you know, these districts didn't exist several months ago. Yeah, so, so yeah I, a lot of work behind the scenes have gone to get this get this going. Mm -hmm. not, well, yeah, best of luck yeah. Uh, for election day. I did want to ask you about this legislative issue that you've mm -hmm. been involved in. We talked about it um, sure. before the session, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the, the bill has kind of evolved a little bit. It's, it had, it's had some changes. Having to do with absentee ballots, um, what Republicans refer to as ballot harvesting. Mm -hmm. Bill has changed a bit. Tell us what it does in its okay. current form. Okay. The sub, it got subbed, right, because Garland Gudger, Senator Garland Gudger's handling it in the Senate, SB1. Right. Um, it protects absentee process, and it only deals with the application portion of the absentee process. It's already illegal to return somebody's ballot for them, so we're only going to address the application portion of the absentee process. So it's really important that this bill gets passed. I appreciate the Senate for taking it up so quickly. I appreciate Governor Ivey for making it a part of her State of the State address and what they've been able to, to, uh, to do. But it addresses where the problem begins, and that's with the application portion of the absentee process. We want to make sure we protect the disabled. Uh, if you look in the bill now, it's enshrining in the bill the federal, basically copying what federal code says, is that if you're disabled by the definition of federal law, you can get anybody that you want to help you from start to finish with the ballot. And the same thing with the military, overseas military voters. Uh, it amends current law, 1711-4, that says any voter, Todd Stacy, can receive assistance from anybody he so chooses. So you can get, still get assistance. We're not changing that at all. What we are making sure of and tightening up is to make sure that you are the one that returns that application not the one helping you do it. So you've got to return it, either in person or by mail, making sure that these third-party vendors can't mass mail pre-filled applications. We've seen that in the past. The office that, that I occupy in the Secretary of State's office in the past has gotten a bunch of telephone calls with aggravated voters saying, why am I getting an application for an absentee ballot? I didn't ask for it. I want to go vote at the precinct. Hmm. So we've seen that and heard that. We want to make sure those third-party vendors aren't mass mailing these applications. And then, of course, the, the, the biggest part of the bill is to make sure that these ballot traffickers, party activists, ballot harvesters can't get paid or compensated to go out and try to round up these applications and manipulate and interfere with the absentee process. So we really think SB1 protects the absentee process for everyone. It's not, you know, it's not, not targeting anybody. It's just making sure we have a good, sound absentee process. And, and I want everybody to hear me. It's important. We've got to protect it because absentee voting is important to a lot of people. Sure. And when you're going to be out of county on election day, you're working, can't make it to the precinct, or you're sick or infirmed, it's important. And we've got to make sure we protect it for those people. Well, I really appreciate you clearing that up. Yeah. I think, you know, the different yeah. subs coming in and out, uh, sure. I really appreciate you, yeah, man. Uh, Thank you. you doing that. Thank you. Well, good luck on election day. I know you're going <laughs> to not, yeah. not get a lot of sleep, but uh, yep. appreciate it. We'll look forward to March 5th. Thanks. I appreciate it, Todd. Thanks. We'll be right back. Lella Warren was born in Clayton Barber County. During a writing career that spanned more than half the 20th century, Warren wrote novels, short stories, autobiographical essays, and features. However, her international reputation was based primarily on the success of a single book, Foundation Stone, a historical novel about a family that settled in Alabama in the frontier period of the 1820s. Foundation Stone was an immediate popular success. 
That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll return on Monday for our nightly coverage of the Alabama Legislature. That's 10.30 p.m. here on Alabama Public Television. Just switch on over after your local news. One more thing before we go. As part of a special effort to encourage civility in politics, Governor Kay Ivey and Tuscaloosa Mayor Walt Maddox recorded a joint video that released today. You may remember the two ran against each other for governor back in 2018. This is coordinated through the National Governors Association. Take a look. I'm Governor Kay Ivey, Republican and a proud Auburn Tiger. And I'm Walt Maddox, Mayor of Tuscaloosa, the greatest football city in America. There are days when hardworking Alabamians want nothing to do with politics in America. And I don't blame them, especially when it gets more combative and contentious than football in Alabama. And that's saying something, but we believe that you can disagree and still listen to understand. Just like how we both understand that our students' education in Alabama is paramount. And we must continue to invest in our students and teachers. So it's okay that we may disagree on some things, especially football. Because changing Alabama and America for the better means learning to disagree better. Putting in the effort to understand each other's perspectives. Because we do not have to agree on everything. But we must learn to disagree better. Roll Tide. War Eagle. More of that, please. More of that. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.